Hi, I'm Matei Zaharia. I'm a co-founder and chief technologist at Databricks. I'm also a CS professor at Stanford. Um, and I don't drink t uh, coffee, but I love tea. Hello and welcome everyone to a very special MLOps community podcast. I am your host, Dimitrios, and I am joined today by none other than Vishnu. What's going on, my man? It's been too long, Dimitrios. Why has it been so long since you've had me on a podcast? I mean, you've been busy, dude. Do you want to tell everybody <laughs> what you've been up to? Well, if you're interested in healthcare claims, which I don't know why you'd be, but I am, I ran, recently ran an online course on how to use claims data, insurance claims to actually, you know, power different healthcare use cases and stuff. So I have been busy. You're right. Yeah. All good things. I love that you are actually shipping something, you know, while some people are just sitting around talking on podcasts, others are going <laughs> out there and creating true products and getting it out to the world. So I appreciate that about you. And I, you know, you said you were going to do okay. it and you actually went and did it. I mean, you have made a lot of claims over the years about writing a lot of blog posts for the MLOps <laughs> community. And I think you've authored uh, two, two, maybe two. one. Two? Two, two, okay, two. Two. It's two. It's two. So I was a little skeptical when you told me that that was actually going to happen, but I mean, you proved me wrong, man, and I'm proud of you. Thanks, man. Now, let's talk about Mate. Let's get into this because yes, sir. what a conversation. I mean, I knew this guy was incredible, but I was not expecting this level of incredibility. What were some of your key takeaways? And then I'll give you mine. Honestly, I think I kind of had two big takeaways. Number one, it's so clear that Matei is somebody that, you know, um, kind of has created like an almost like an intellectual village, <laughs> you know, at Stanford, at Databricks, just like clearly bounces ideas around a lot, has a lot of wide ranging conversations, is thinking big. And I think it's just a lesson for all of us to, you know, continuously sharpen our ideas by sharing it with others, however that might be. Uh, and take advantage of the smart people in our lives. So that that's sort of one thing. I think the other thing that I learned from him was just understanding that translational gap. You know, there are a lot of open source projects out there that never really, you know, get used by a ton of people and are never successfully commercialized, right? And and Databricks, Databricks has been a part of two, not just like major ones, but like industry legends, right? And MLflow and Huge. Spark, not to mention other open source stuff that they've also been, you know, promoting and and, and sort of commercializing. And so I think it was just interesting to hear how he thinks about shipping with users, building with people, you know, to to kind of get that early traction, whether it's an open source project or a, or a product. Uh, so those were sort of my takeaways. What were yours? Oof. So good. And I'm going to just say yes and to everything you said, because it is so true. I mean, for me, I didn't know he was a rock band fan. I found that one out. So if anybody's looking for a Christmas present for Mate, get him Rock Band and preferably the Beatles edition because that was one of the best ones. And the thing that I loved was when he started talking about these large language models. I mean, sadly, he did use the term LLM ops, which I'm trying to make sure doesn't actually become a thing, but I, it's got more momentum than I can handle. I, it's all being put on my shoulders and I can't do it. So I may cave and start saying it sooner rather than later. But he talked about how much of the operational cost and the resource intensive act it is to actually create a large language model. And then if it's not that good, you've got something on your hands that you can't just like make incrementally better or make like astronomically better by any means you got to go back to square one so you kind of have one shot at it and you go and whatever it comes out with you're stuck with it and when he was talking about some of the work he's doing at stanford with potentially smaller models that have access to databases that they can pull from and the ability for you to update those databases and then the the small language models are able to pull from those. I thought that was fascinating. I love getting into that. And I really just, I mean, honestly, I just loved seeing the way the guy thinks and the things that he is looking at and how he analyzes things. It, there's a reason that the company is doing from what the rumors have said and 
potentially his PR team is going to make us cut this out, but I'm going to say it anyway. We've heard on the street they're doing like a billion in revenue. And so I, it makes sense, man. I mean, he took Spark and it was nothing. He talked to a lot of users and it became the behemoth that it is. And I actually, <laughs> you want to talk about using terms, I have been trying to make this cool. Check out this term. When something, usually a piece of technology, gets sideswiped by another piece of technology, I just call that it gets hadooped. And Mate single-handedly hadooped hadoop. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good one. Uh, so say. hopefully MLOps is not going to get hadooped anytime soon. For those who are listening and this is your first time tuning in, I will remind you that we have got a newsletter. We've got, actually, we've got three newsletters that you can join. So jump in on that. We've also got the Slack community that is a vibrant place. We've got the local meetups all around the globe and the virtual meetups. And what would mean the world to us, what would mean the world to us, Vishnu, if the listeners would just subscribe. Oh, dude, there's your college <laughs> acapella group is coming out in I full thought I'd give them, right now. Give them a little taste on the smooth right. mic. <laughs> Let's get into it before all of a sudden the watch rate just dropped. It plummeted right there before we can even, even get to Matte and everybody just dropped off, dude. All right, that's it. Here's Matte. I want to start. I really want to get to know Matte the person because I feel like you give a ton of talks and you are known throughout the community for your intellect and the tools that you've created but i would love to just start with like how you come up with ideas yeah great question yeah i think i don't know i mean i, I think a lot of it is you know just talking to a wide range of uh, people and and you know trying to figure out hey what what challenges are they facing? What are what are things they're excited about? You know, uh, with uh, with ML um, and putting some of those ideas together. So I'm I'm pretty fortunate to be able to see, you know, like both the academic research world and people there thinking about like what's a really new research idea, and you know, just companies that are actually trying to use ML to like make something happen um, through uh, through Databricks. And of course, there's also Databricks own perspective you know, using ML internally for various things. So I think just like hearing about problems across a wide range of people helps you uh, helps you synthesize sort of new ideas. And beyond that, I mean, I also like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a big believer in like going for a walk and like, you know, taking time to think about things and like really like, you know, kind of asking about the next level question, like, you know, what's what's a better way to do this? So when you want your ideas challenged, who do you go to? Oh, that's very easy. Uh, all, you know, my co-founders, all the folks at Databricks, we, we have a culture of, you know, debate and, you know, raising questions. So it's very straightforward. But yeah, bouncing bouncing ideas off folks helps a lot. Yeah. I, I love this idea that you're speaking of, of trying to get to the next level of questions and finding those blind spots that you have. And... <laughs> Like the, the shower principle, I find, is one of those funny ones where you think about something really hard, right? And then you forget about it, take a shower, and that's when the answer comes to you. I, I love uh -huh. it when that happens because it feels like you don't have to do the hard work. But you've already put it in. But can you talk to us a little bit about Spark? Because that's almost like machine learning lore by now. And I would love to hear how Spark went from being an idea that you were bouncing around with people to actually becoming a full-fledged product and being used by a ton of people. So so Spark started out when I was a PhD student. And um, at that point, I was really interested in this kind of data center scale computing that was happening mostly at web companies at the time, like Google, you know, Yahoo was a, was a big company, uh, Microsoft and so on. Um, and they were, you know, mostly doing things with the web and indexing the whole web and then doing stuff on top of it. And there were, 
you know, in like right before I, I started my PhD, there were these open source projects to do mappages like, like Hadoop that had started out. And so more companies were thinking about it. And I thought, you know, collecting, collecting data isn't actually that expensive. The cost of storage is pretty low. And there are so many things that produce data that like every company, every scientific lab and so on will want to use. So I thought, hey, many more people will care about this, like just programming with, with large scale data. And um, so I wanted to learn about it. And I, I worked um, at the beginning, I actually met a lot of the users of the open source tools. I, I collaborated with them on, on, on some projects so I can move things there. But I also quickly realized that, um, you know, these tools were um, really limited in the kind of applications they could run. They were good for building a web index, but they weren't good for running, you know, a more interesting algorithm like machine learning. And the interesting thing is as soon as everyone collected lots of data and organized it, they wanted to run all these applications. You know, no one stopped at like, okay, we, we've downloaded and like organized the whole web, but all we want to do is like search it. You know, they, they wanted to do other stuff with it. So it was very clear early on that people wanted it to do a whole lot more algorithms on it. And then with Spark, um, we identified like two use cases that, that people couldn't do well. One, one was machine learning with, with iterated algorithms like SGD. And then the other one was um, interactive ad hoc queries. And we built an engine that was you know, primarily for those two things at first. Uh, over time, it expanded to doing you know, all the other like large scale on disk batch processing stuff you can do. And the the other reason it became very closely tied to machine learning is um, at Berkeley, where I was a student, you know, we didn't have huge data sets. We didn't have like scientists who are running a giant website or anything like that. So I was looking for people there who actually wanted to do large scale computing. And I was in a lab sitting next to machine learning people and they all wanted to try, you know, that. So a lot of the early users were doing um, large scale machine learning there. That's awesome. I mean, since you brought it up, one thing that I did want to ask you about was the crew in Berkeley and correct me if I'm wrong, what is it, Amp Lab? Yeah. What was it like working in that crew? What was that whole experience? It was a great group. I think in, in my year when I started my PhD, a ton of students uh, came to Berkeley. Actually, like a lot of the people I met at all the the grad school, you know, visit days and other places ended up coming there. I don't know why, maybe the weather was nicer there that year when we visited or something, but, you know, a lot of them did. And um, so we had a big group of friends from the beginning and, you know, there were all the other folks who had been in the lab before. And one cool thing about this lab is um, the, it was, so the, the Berkeley faculty who are involved, they, there were a lot of people who work on computer systems and databases, but they also, they were interested in looking at how uh, machine learning interacts with those, basically. So they also put in Mike Jordan. Mike Jordan is, you know, a big machine learning researcher. Um, and they had us all, you know, kind of sit in the same physical space. And they actually, like, created a big open area where we would play, like, rock band, you know, in the evenings and stuff like that. Like, it was a really nice space. And you got That's to meet these people that you wouldn't have met normally in, uh, you know, in schools where they're just like on different floors and, you know, you like never run into them. So I think that created a lot of cross-pollination and people people became friends, but people also like thought about research ideas across these things. That's how the machine learning people, like when they, when they saw I was working on Spark, a bunch of them came to me and said, hey, we, we want to try some of this stuff. So, yeah. Wait, do you play any instruments? No, I don't. I did play rock band. I, I wasn't rock good at it. And <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> rock band is a great instrument. Um, yeah. I, I love the description of the sort of open and, and freewheeling sort of cross pollination that you're talking about at Amp Lab. I feel like that's how, you know, so many of the iconic environments that have, you know, seeded, uh, you know, great ideas actually operate. And I'm kind of curious. You know, how do you keep that sort of culture of cross-pollination, um, you know, part of Databricks, you know, as it's grown to be a much larger organization, but is still pushing out, you know, very forward-thinking products? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, so one thing is that internally we have a very 
open um, and transparent culture. Like basically, you know, like the, um, you know, our, the CEO like basically like shows everyone in the company, you know, the, the same the same kind of things that that he'd show to the the board basically. Um, so um, so there's a lot of like discussion of all all the things going on, and also anytime um, you know like like someone designs something or proposes something or whatever, by default, you know, you're supposed to send it to a mailing list that basically like every engineer is on and every product manager and like anyone else can sign up for that list too. So you can easily like send out a thing and then have, you know, like, you know, VP of like sales in a region looking at it and have like, you know, me looking at it and, and who knows who else. Um, so it does encourage everyone to hear about things that are going on and um, and comment on them. Um, beyond that, I think having, um, you know, especially for like specific topics, having, um, um, you know, offsites or like sort of mini retreats for each team um, can can help. Like it's it's very different from sitting around and on Zooms or, or um, you know, like just seeing a few people once in a while and, and sending docs around. Um, so we try to, yeah. to encourage that. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the bigger thing is just to make sure that everyone has a chance to like hear about all the pieces and provide, you know, their view on it. And it's not uncommon to have like a lead, a CEO, you know, send an email and then have like other people say, oh, I kind of disagree with this, you know, here's why, and then have a bunch of debate. Um, all right. So if I'm understanding this correctly, you win, you were at Berkeley, created Spark, and you were hanging out with some ML researchers and they said, you know what, that would be great for what we're working on. And then uh -huh. you decided to create a company from it and you brought this culture into the company and you recognized that you needed to be pinging ideas off of people as much as possible and testing your assumptions. Now, the actual formation of Spark really is something that I, I'm wondering, like, where did you go from there once you started Databricks in those first days? Tell us about that. What was that like? Yeah, so I mean, so before we started uh, the company, uh, Spark had, you know, was around as an open source project. And, um, you know, it quickly went from like, I used to know all the users, there were like, you know, like three companies using it and a couple of people at Berkeley, and I would go and visit them every so often and like, oh, that's awesome. help them out because they were trying out this, this research project to, it went to a, a place where like, I didn't know all the users and even better, like I didn't have to answer all the questions on the mailing list because like people answered <laughs> each other's questions. So, okay. um, so it was really happen? cool. When did that happen or? How fast? Um, I think all this happened within about two years, maybe three years. Yeah. Because we first open sourced it in 2010 and then we started the company in 2013. And like, you know, as we were starting it, it this community had already, you know, began forming. So it was pretty fast. It was definitely, you know, like the right thing at the right time because everyone was excited about large scale ML and data analytics and, um, you know, compared to programming and all the other tools, it was it was just much easier. And it was also designed to support like libraries and an ecosystem of packages, like so you can just download and, and mix things, whereas the other stuff wasn't. Yeah, So so we saw the community forming and then um, you know, we also realized that to like really get this to the next level and have it used, you know, beyond tech companies and so on, it needs a company backing it because all, you know, all the companies in this space were felt like maybe somewhat threatened by this thing. They didn't, they didn't want to adopt it. We actually went and tried to convince them to adopt it. And they said, you know, not right now, like, can you, can you help us with like our other system instead? Why were they yeah. threatened? Well, because it's a sort of, um, you know, they don't have like full control and understanding of what's going to happen with it. And it kind of competes with the existing products like Hadoop. And it's sort of a, this unpredictable, like kind of thing in your roadmap. Um, you made all these plans and now, you know, you, th there's this other thing that that's coming around. And honestly, it is hard to tell, right? In their shoes, I would have said, yeah, it's hard to tell how big will this thing be? You know, will it actually work well? What if it, what if there are bugs? What if it's like really hard to make it? you know, stable and reliable. So it's a little bit scary, but having a company helped, um, helped like really make the open source project, uh, awesome because we can, we could hire people to contribute to it full time. 
And also, I think it helped other companies decide to take that jump and invest and, and you know, join the community and, and contribute in some form. And once there were enough of them, of course, that would just happen on its own. So you had Spark and Databricks has also created, you know, MLflow, which is sort of, you know, another sort of seminal open source project. I'm kind of wondering, can you tell us a little bit about the ways that the Spark story and the MLflow story were similar? I mean, given that MLflow or, and, and different, right? You know, yeah. I mean, given that MLflow came out later, did it have like, a lot more adoption more quickly from those big companies that were originally more, you know, resistant. I'm kind of curious just how they played out. Yeah, the same I mean, difference. I would say, yeah, definitely one difference is um, when you launch an open source project from, from a company that's backing it and is, you know, like looking for collaborators and so on early on, it's a lot easier to convince people that this will be something solid that they can kind of bet on and um, and design, you know, their op ML ops process and so on around. So. Um, so that helped a lot. It's it's much easier versus a um, research project where they say, well, you know, it's a bunch of grad students, like maybe they're, you know, th th they're like smart and stuff, but who knows what they're going to do in the future and who knows how solid this is in production. But there are a lot of similarities. I think one of the biggest ones, I kind of hinted at this before, was identifying the need for um, an ecosystem and sort of a standard for certain things. So, for example, with MLflow, like we, you know, we looked at the the MLOff space and we saw there's no there's no open source solution that anyone can just kind of extend to add support for their ML tools. Like, for example, if I run one of the cloud um, ML, um, you know, like platforms like SageMaker, it's it's you know it's nice, it's it's well engineered, but if I'm developing a new framework, like I'm developing the next PyTorch or whatever, I can't get, you know, SageMaker to, to integrate closely with it unless like someone at Amazon decides to to spend time and do it. So we wanted something that people could could extend um, where, uh, you know, everyone benefits from it. And, and we thought that there is going to be some open source, you know, if, if there was an open source thing with, with that property, it would be it would be successful because it's in everyone's interest. Users want the thing with um, great integrations, and also developers of either commercial or open source uh, projects want it to work. And really, the contribution we can make is trying to figure out just the definitions, like what are you know what is a metric, what is a model, what is an experiment, like the, and and get everyone to agree on some common. APIs and concepts for these, and then you, you'd get a really um, useful platform for users. So that was that's the way we started, and that's partly inspired by what we saw in Spark, which is in Spark, as I was saying, there were all these tools for like writing distributed applications, like Hadoop, MapReduce, you know, various streaming tools, all kinds of stuff like that. But no one like just wants to write a completely new application from scratch that no, that no one else did. People want to run, um, you know, libraries, packages, like existing algorithms, right? Like the, the first thing you do in most programs is you import a bunch of packages. So for example, like even though it was cool that you could write, say, distributed k-means in like a few lines of code in, in MapReduce or in Spark, no one actually wants to write it. They want to just call a library for like a great implementation that's, you know, numerically stable and like fast and all that stuff. And it wasn't easy to make libraries for the other frameworks. So in Spark, we designed it so you can have, you can just call a function and pass in like your Spark context or your data frame or whatever, and they could chain more computation onto it. And then when you run the program, the whole thing executes efficiently. Like all the functions that have been chained together go into one execution plan and the system optimizes it and you get really good performance. So now you can import a lot of stuff. So we put a lot of stuff in the built-in libraries, but there are also really great, um, you know, libraries outside, like all the data sources, all the ML libraries on Spark, all the, you know, like geospatial and domain-specific um, things out there. Um, and that just hadn't existed before. And it just makes sense from a programming point of view to really encourage composition. That makes a ton of sense. And what I want to kind of zoom, double click, whatever you want, <laughs> whatever term you want to use into is the aha moment that you had for MLflow. Because retrospectively, a lot of the things that MLflow defined, you know, they now make sense. They are industry standards, right? And, you know, uh -huh. in terms of what we think about a metric or a pipeline, you know, these are concepts that make sense. 
going back in time, what was the moment where you knew that those sort of concepts in ML flow would make sense and get sort of the the buzz that they did? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so we we added things, you know, one by one to the project, and as we added a new concept, we um, we wanted to make sure we we really validated with 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 potential users and like we really think through all the use cases. So you know, it grew over time. So so for example, I remember like. You know, we, we started out with like, uh, we started out mainly with experiments and like multi-step projects you, you could run um, and basically doing tracking across those. And then soon after we added the model registry, which is kind of, I mean, it's a common concept now. Everyone like, you know, either has one or is adding some version of that, but it's a, basically it's a, it's a place where you can have version models and you can have something that looks like a pull request where you can say, you know, I have a proposal for a new model, but other people can review it, you know, automated like processes, like automated bots can also review it and comment on it. And then like you only approve it if that passes. So for all of these things, you know, we we talked, we tried to talk to, you know, many different users at different kinds of companies. So at the very start, it was hard because we didn't, you know, have anything. But but once we launched the the basic ML flow, there were, there were users uh, both on Databricks. So, so like, customers that you can we can easily talk to and then open source and we tried to talk to people at very different stages like some of our customers were small startups with like you know one or two machine learning people who are building like say their product recommendation and and the whole company is like 10 people uh some of them were huge enterprises with with many machine learning teams and like you know each team like some teams were in production for years already some teams were just starting and usually if you if you float, um, you know, some some idea or some design by a bunch of these and, and do something that like seems to be good for, you know, like three, four or five of them that are pretty diverse, it's likely to be good for, you know, many, many other folks as well. I think the other thing we did is we tried to keep the number of concepts low and to keep things simple. So like cut away at stuff and, and that I think makes it easier for people to learn as well. And that's something you you have to be disciplined about because it's very tempting to just add new things. So yeah, when, once we have that loop, I think given the diversity of customers and, and also of open source users we could work with, it it was um, it was much easier to tell like, you know, whether something um, is a great idea or not. As much as I want to dive into MLflow right now, I will mention to the listeners, we had Corey and Ben on the podcast before, and they're some of the lead maintainers of that. It's episode number 103, if you want to go and listen to a whole hour of just ML Flow talk. What I want to get into now, Matte, is, I mean, and don't take this the wrong way, but do you listen to DJ Khaled at all? You don't strike me as the person that knows or listens to him much. I mean, I know who he is, yeah, but... Uh, All right, so listen, I feel so like so. you're for a bit of the DJ Khaled of the ML world because you just are <laughs> dropping a hit after a hit. It's like, and another one, and another one. And so what I want to know now is, where's your head at? What's the next hit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, there are, there are a few things we're, we're doing. So I'll mention so some, some Databricks stuff we're working on and then also... Some stuff that my research group at um, at Stanford's been been doing. Um, so at Databricks, like one of the things we're uh, very excited about is um, really tightly integrating ML with uh, data, and it it comes in two ways. So one obvious one is when you build and and drain ML, you you drain it on data. So like you know obviously like we you know we try to make that easy. But another really interesting thing that we we realized is a huge amount of ML ops is in some sense data analytics. So basically you're running the model, maybe you're running different versions of it, and you're passing in, you know, like you're passing inputs and it's it's creating predictions. And then later you want to analyze, you know, how did it do? So maybe later you have um, you have feedback, like for example, you showed someone a, a product um, on the web page, but they didn't click it or they didn't click it, right? And that that feedback comes later after a few minutes. And so there's a lot of data analytics to combine, like, you know, to, to analyze all the events that happened after your model came out and then maybe join them with other events and combine them and, and get a great picture of what's happening. 
we've built, for example, our, our model monitoring tool, like basically, you know, can put all these events from your model as it's running into a table, and then you can use all the data warehousing and, and analytics features we have to, to analyze that table. And we've built kind of a unified data and model observability toolkit where, you know, whether it's like an inputs table that's generated upstream or an outputs table uh, like that's coming out of your model, you can do things like check for shifts in distribution, do these like delayed kind of feedback calculations where like you, you see, okay, I, I thought this was happening, but then, you know, here's what actually happened later and basically get a bunch of operators to hook them together. And you can also take all these and get a, um, like a nice dashboard or automated alert based on, you know, the entire pipeline. So that's like one thing, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but we, we call that lake house ML or just in general, like integrating data with ML and treating them as, um, you know, like they're, they're both basically processes that like, you know, produce data and you want to yeah. be able to analyze and, and monitor that and measure different things about it. And a bit of a tangent there, <laughs> because I heard it's a good story before we jump into the other cool stuff that you're doing, how did you come up with the name Data Lake House? Like s since we started Databix pretty much, you know, we, we let people do data science and like data transformation and pipelines, but we had people who wanted to, um, you know, treat their data lake as, um, as a warehouse and, and just, you know, connect um, uh, BI tools to it, like Tableau and, and Power BI and, and throw in like, you know, enable like anyone who can use SQL to, to basically query that data. So we always, you know, we wanted to tell this story of like, it's not just a bunch of files. You, as you work on them, you can organize them, you can create, you know, tables and schemas and, and do like sort of rich data management on there. You can enable um, these, uh, these data warehousing workloads. And it's like really interesting because it means you don't have to copy that data across lots of systems and manage very different systems. But we had trouble like really, you know, coming up with a term for this. I think when we started, we had, we actually used terms like virtual data warehouse or just in time data warehouse and so on. And none of them like really stuck. And then uh, one, one the of the, the, the engineers here who is, uh, you know, who's good at uh, naming things had this idea in like some meeting or some doc about lake house. He said, Hey, what well, you, you got this lake, you, you, you want to claim it does warehousing stuff too, but it's, it's really supposed to be more, and it's supposed to be like nicer than either of those things. Like who wants to spend time in a warehouse or, or whatever. So, so why not do <laughs> lake house? And that, that really stuck. And, you know, we owed a bunch of stuff about it. I think it's, it, it may be a term that like, you know, other people were also thinking about, but it, it quickly became like an industry standard thing where like, if you look at Amazon or Microsoft or like Google cloud, now they all claim they, you know, they offer some kind of lake house. But I think, again, it's one of these things where like, it's awesome to, you know, have a lot of people kind of, you know, crunching on the, the problem or like hearing about it. And then, you know, someone may come up with this, with this cool idea and, and sort of propagate it. Such an underappreciated skill to have the naming conventions. Oh yeah. There's some, no, some people it... are really great at naming, so good to figure out who they are and ask them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that engineer got the got the raise that he deserved for that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. I kind of want to, you know, one of the things that is coming up as a theme in this conversation is that clearly there are a lot of great people that you've had the privilege of working with, being taught by, teaching. And one of those great places um, that you're at now is Stanford. Uh -huh. And Stanford uh, consistently has an outstanding sort of machine learning profile. So many experts are there. In our, in our notes, one of the things that Demetrius and I noted was it's almost like the YC of machine learning, <laughs> where it's just like consistently putting out interesting ideas. We've had actually some of your PhD students on our podcast, like Cody, mm -hmm. Cody Coleman, who was on an earlier episode. And I kind of just want to ask, you know, from your standpoint, what is it that is so unique about the environment and the culture of Stanford and the computer science department that allows this sort of flourishing to occur? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a great department overall. Like you know, great set of faculty, and it's grown that reputation over time. So it's able to attract a lot of great um, folks to do it. You know, as as it's changing. Of course, one really unique thing about it is that um, it is so close to Silicon Valley. So you know, a lot of people from industry 
um, will uh, you know will come visit and talk to people. So it's like it's like super easy. Like even I mean um, you you know in in other universities, like I would reach out to 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 people at companies and say, hey, can I can I come meet you and like present about like this research project or whatever? And they'd say, yeah, you know, come down. In this one, they're like, uh, oh yeah, I'd love to hear about it. Actually, I'll come down to campus because you know it's a it's a nice place. I want to like let's have lunch there or let's have coffee. So it's just so convenient for that. And so uh, as a student there, you can easily hear from um, you know people at huge companies that are doing stuff. You can hear from other people, from, you know, from people at startups. Um, you've got a lot of uh, venture capitalists nearby who you know my my sense is like they will cold call like on every student and you know ask them what they're doing all the time it's what one of the things that they're trying to do so so it's it's just easy to get a lot of perspectives and i also think the network of uh, you know alumni and and people like otherwise associated with it is uh, is is really great so yeah it's just i think it's a you know it started out you know forming this community and it's also physically like very convenient for everyone to go and like you know to, to go chat with you about stuff that makes a ton of sense i mean that campus is like gorgeous and anybody would want to spend <laughs> a lot of time there <laughs> on a personal note did you ever think that you you know going into your sort of like phd or going into your sort of research journey that you would be you know sort of so translational in your career Right, you'd start a company, and that company would kind of spin out uh, like all these different products. Like, did, was that something that you always envisioned, or is that something that maybe you saw more of at Stanford, given the culture? Or... Yeah, when I went into my PhD, I wasn't necessarily thinking to to start a company or to be a professor. Really, I just, you know, I wanted to like. I thought it's a great opportunity to, you know, learn about cool things and explore, you know, some some new things for a while. Um, you can you can kind of work on whatever you want for like five or six years, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do after. I just wanted to like find you know uh, exciting things to work on, you know, and hopefully like have have some impact through them. You know, we, at Berkeley, like we started, you know, we were all, we were all at Berkeley. There were some people, um, you know, like launching companies. Actually, both my my advisors had done companies before that were, um, you know. Th- that were successful in various ways. They got a, a bunch of funding. Um, Scott Schenker's company, uh, Nisira, was was acquired by VMware to do their virtual network uh, infrastructure. So, so you know, they they had some connections to that world, but it wasn't like it, it wasn't like everyone's looking around to, to to build a company. You know, they were just interested in what are cool, you know, technology uh, changes that are happening. What are what are opportunities to do something interesting, and also. Like what would actually be useful to people, um, but yeah, I happened to pick um, you know a, an area that you know m- made a lot of sense to focus on, which was this large-scale data-intensive computing. All the trends were aligned for this to become a really big thing, and you know one of the big things missing for it, it was easier um, programming interfaces, right? So everyone thought, oh, only tech companies can build this, but it turned out you can build better interfaces and and we did, right? And so within a few years we had like, you know, basically anyone who can, you know, who knows even a little bit of programming um, and maybe their main job is something else can use some Python or some R or some SQL with Spark and and on computation on like hundreds of servers. And, you know, people were very excited about that and about sort of democratizing access to these things and um, so it became an even bigger you know potential set of people who would work with it um, yeah and I think again with the company you know when when we when I started the project I wasn't like set on you know figuring out a, something that would be good for a company but we saw there's this opportunity we, we did all of us on on the founding team cared a lot about you know real world impact and like helping people do new things um, and we saw uh, we thought, hey, the best way to do this is to actually, like, you know, start a company around this and, like, really be able to fund it and learn from the most serious users. You know, not not just like smaller groups who would talk to us, but like, you know, go go after the hardest ones and figure out like what it takes to to help them do things with data and machine learning. Got it. I have a a question that just came to me. It's not on our pre-planned set of questions. <laughs> what is the one thing that you emphasize or one piece of advice that you give your grad students 
uh, or to the people that you mentor that others don't or don't enough? Like, what's the one thing that you uniquely emphasize? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know, because because uh, faculty tend to say a lot of things, so I guess quite possible that <laughs> anything I said, <laughs> someone has said. Sure, um, sure. I think, um, yeah, I mean, one one thing is is like really... You know, put yourself in the in the shoes of like a, a user of the technology um, or of your system, and like really try to understand what they're thinking about and um, you know what their their challenges are. So, um, so I, I've told a lot of students, you know, if you really want to understand like this type of thing you're working on, like whatever whatever it is, like maybe it's like you know vector databases or like you know um, like parallel deep learning, like something like that go and like try to find someone who you know who needs to do that thing as as their job and like see what the challenges are and there there might be like totally new things you hadn't thought about and and uh that that no one in the research community thinks about and yeah same thing applies outside research right if you don't you know if you're developing a product but you don't like fully understand you know what it is to use it and like what actual things are people trying to use it for um, you you'll miss out on on some opportunities. So I think that uh, that um, ability to, to, that that opportunity to like see the world from a different perspective, and then go back to your perspective and like you know use all the knowledge you have and all all the skills you have is uh, is important. So basically, just invite people to play rock band for a little bit <laughs> and see if they're open to telling you what's on their mind. Yeah, that doesn't hurt. Yeah. Yeah, or just do that thing hands on. Like, go, you know, you're developing a, um, you know, like a web server that you think is like faster or whatever, like, or more reliable. Go build some websites and see, you know, what 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 happens when you do that or whatever it is. So, you hinted at this earlier that you have a few things that you're excited about. One is on the Databricks side, and the other is with the research that you're doing. Can you go into a bit more of that? Yeah, I mean, we've been doing a, a bunch of different things in my group, but one thing. I'm really excited about uh, where we also have some an open source project is basically building you know complex applications using large language models. So using language models as um, as a building block in in a in a more sophisticated pipeline. And we have this this project DSP demonstrate search predict that lets you build applications out of um, LLMs plus. Um, other systems that that return text, and the big one we're looking at is is search and retrieval systems. Um, so you can do things like you can build a you know a, a question answering system that where you ask a question about uh, say Wikipedia, and it does multiple searches over it. Like as it reads each, each article, it then searches for other ones, and then it returns an answer to your question. And basically, the reason I'm excited about it is. You know, normally, like if you just use LLMs on their own, um, they are, um, you know, they, they they often like can understand a bunch of instructions and, and produce pretty good outputs. But it's it's hard to control uh, the quality. And if you get something that's only like seventy percent or eighty percent of, of the time working, and the rest it's not, it's not great for a lot of applications. It, it's good for some things, but not for everything. But in this project, where Putting the LLM sort of in um in a box where like we we try to give it a very specific task and we also have ways of um you know um in, improving reliability around that like ways of um you know generate finding all the mistakes it did and then fine tuning it on to to fix those um or calling it multiple times or calling multiple models or whatever and so it's just one building block in this pipeline you create um, that overall can be. Can be more reliable and can can do things that uh, the LLM alone couldn't. And building an app by, you know, programming this kind of pipeline and calling existing LMs is just so much easier and less expensive than trying to train one from scratch and then like realizing, okay, now it's ninety percent correct, but it's still like not quite correct when I spend like you know huge amount of time training it. Um, so yeah, I'm excited yeah. about this approach of like let's. Let's use it as just one building block in a in a bigger application. I like to say that LLMs hallucinate more than your average college student. <laughs> and <Probably. laughs> so the thing that I'm really interested in, I mean, it sounds like you don't want to go down the path of training your own large language model 
and having that for Databricks as like a service. How do you see large language models and like the new revolution that's happening right now in AI fitting in with the work that you're doing at Databricks? Yeah, no, don't, don't get me wrong. I think it is super important to be able to train your own model and it's, it's definitely something that we we do. We, we help people uh, train them. But um, I also think when you're building an application, like training is a pretty... Um, it, it is a is a useful tool, but it's a pretty like um, you know coarse sort of uh, tool where like you, you it takes a lot of time to use it, and then if it doesn't work out, like you know it's it's really hard to to improve the quality beyond there. So if you I, I do think a lot of that's involved in in getting um, you know great applications of these involves you know other pieces after. Like a good example, there's this blog post where someone like reverse engineers basically the API calls into into GitHub Copilot. And they point out that, you know, each time you call Copilot, you actually send a lot of information about the context in your program. Like what are all the file names, what are all the classes, what are some functions and things here. And it's trained to take that context and then produce a completion based on that. Basically, you can do a lot more like end to end to improve an application, and this is where the ML ops come in. You know, you might think like, wait, without LLMs, you don't need ML ops anymore. You just need to like talk to it. But I think you are gonna need like LLM ops, basically, or whatever you want to LLM ML ops, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> that uh, uh, you know lets you use this within a bigger application and experiment with the whole. Uh, pipeline of of getting stuff in and out of it, so I just think it's important to to think about both of these. Yeah, yeah, this is fascinating. You said something there that is so crucial that I hadn't thought about. It's like you don't really this, you don't get two chances, or I mean, you can have infinite chances if you have infinite resources and uh, and cash to burn. You can just keep creating large language models, but like you said the output or the large language model that you create it's what you get and then to yeah. make it better if it's not that good of the base model or whatever to make it better is really hard uh -huh. and so that's something that i hadn't even thought about as far as the ones who are training those models it is a bit of a risk and yeah. you really want to make sure there's so many things that can go wrong uh -huh. when it comes to training those i mean Oof. Yeah, yeah. So it's as a like you know ML researcher, I'm really excited about these these models that are very powerful out of the box. But as an engineer, thinking of like, okay, if I want the hooks to like, you know, improve my startup, so I'd have a like conversion rate or something with these things. As an engineer, I want to have you know way more levers, like way more tools, so I can like really control what's uh, what's happening with them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So right now, if you were out there and you were going to start a company what kind of company would you start hey yeah it's a it's a great question i think um i mean there's a lot of excitement about machine learning now certainly more than you know i mean there's always been a lot with with deep learning but i think especially now with with everyone being able to try out like chat gpd and you know talk to it uh it's kind of funny but that like very simple change in programming interface from like a little text box on uh, on on instruct gpd to you know a chat thing like really got a lot of people to think about it so um i mean i think the the yeah i i actually think the you know one of the most exciting things is like looking at application areas where these models can help and then developing something specialized for that and then getting this sort of um flywheel of you know, as you build an app, like the first app that uses LLMs to do whatever, like, you know, whatever AI you're working on, um, you get a lot of data and, and experience with it that then makes it hard for others to catch up. Because, you know, when you when you start a company, you, you always want to have like something that you, you learn over time, some advantage you get where like, you know, over time it becomes more valuable. And I think ML provides this ability to develop, like if you're the first to do a certain thing and, and you execute it well, it will just get better, you know, faster than uh, someone else who can get started. So that's the kind of space I would look for. And I would assume that the technology around these things is pretty fluid and, and there'll be new new types of technology coming out. 
Uh, but you know, there are other things you can do too. If you can build like a, a better GPU, like, you know, go, go for it. You know, that's, uh, um, I think a ton of people would want that. You know, there, there are many infrastructure things you can also uh, build. One question I had hearing you talk about the LLMs and, you know, what challenges or opportunities they pose is really about the institutions that have created these LLMs, right? You know, the Google researches, the open AIs mm -hmm. and, you know, um, Google brains, whatever, you know, we have seen over the last 10 to 15 years, kind of an interesting emergence of corporate research labs, you know, that have a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of talent and are really developing sort of cutting edge products and research. And they have a symbiotic sort of interesting relationship with university departments, right? Which have traditionally been more of the bastions of research. You know, from your standpoint, how do you think about the emergence of those corporate research labs, you know, and how they are shaping the future of AI? Like, you know, where do you see that going over the next five to 10 years? From your standpoint, is that sort of a, a productive model for research or how, how do you think about that? Yeah, so, so um, it, it's very interesting. I think what's happened recently is that um, people discover that th there are some ML approaches where you can throw in scale at it, throw in lots of resources, uh, lots of data, and actually get better results. So they went to, you know, they, they're, they're just trying to throw in a lot of that and, and do these large-scale experiments and build these large-scale models. But of course, it's less accessible to everyone else. And one of the things that had made machine learning and deep learning progress so quickly was that uh, many people could, um, you know, could work on these problems. And there were like, you know, all these like tens of thousands of like, you know, researchers um, at universities who, who um, you know, who are trying out new things. And then someone finds the thing that works and everyone builds on it. So I think that's actually maybe going to slow down with these big companies, which is um, a bit of a problem for the field. But I think it also means that if someone discovers a much cheaper way to do some of these things, like all the research focus will fix will shift to that because uh, more people are able to play around with it, right? So, um, so I think uh, you know there is a possibility that like we'll we'll end up with a new way of doing these tasks that is uh, that is cheaper. I'll just mention one thing with the LM specifically because if you look at um, if you compare them with computer vision. Um, it's pretty different. In computer vision, you don't need like a huge data center to, to train a very good model. It kind of, I mean, of course, they get better with more parameters and stuff, but we, they're they're quite good with uh, you know a reasonable size. And I think with LMs, part of the reason you need it is because the model encodes um, and sort of memorizes a whole lot of knowledge about the world, right? So like when you talk to chat GPD, it can answer topics on all kinds of random stuff, like every sports team, you know, like every video game, like everything that's been written up somewhere, but it has to like remember all that info. And so even though it's large, a lot of the parameters are just hosting that. So I actually think it's quite possible that you can decouple like the knowledge storage from the um, the sort of like language processing or like computing that's happening and end up with a small model if you take if you have a smaller neural network plus the ability to query just a search index basically like a database or something with your knowledge you might be able to produce equally good answers and that's one of the things that like my group has been working on, of, um, you know, is, is to, to, to try to make this happen, at least for a specific task. So I, I would say it's not crazy to imagine a world with, you know, much smaller models plus, you know, search or like basically memory lookups instead of um, let's run lot, lots of floating point operations. That makes so much sense to me because also, again, going back to the operational overhead and the resource overhead that you need for these large uh -huh. language models if you can do it with a smaller model and just have that context there for it when it needs it yeah that seems like it's a much more obvious play yeah exactly and the, the other aspect that's like really important to, for building a system is if you separate these out you can also update the knowledge very cheaply you don't have to retrain like like a good example is um you know, like, let's say the, yeah. the model memorized that the president of the U.S. is like Joe Biden. But then after the election, it's someone else. You don't have to wait like three months to retrain it. You just go, you know, upload the latest, um, you know, Wikipedia article on that thing and it finds it. So. Ah, 
Yeah, that is killer. And that makes complete sense. So last question I've got for you, man. When you look around and you look at the ecosystem, what are some companies that tend to stay on your mind or and or you greatly respect? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of great companies in, in this space. Uh, I would say, like, you know, obviously, in, you know, in, in the past few years, like uh, OpenAI has, has had a huge amount of impact on, um, you know, getting more developers to think about uh, using deep learning. So, so that's been cool to see. And, and I think, you know, whether like some people, they, they say it was uh, sort of unintentional that ChatGPT would become so popular and so on, and it, it probably exceeded the expectations, but they've done, you know, a, a, a great uh, amount of stuff to get a lot of people to try these approaches. So, so that's been pretty cool. I mean, I think it's also great to see a lot of ML ops um, uh, and ML infrastructure companies uh, that are successful, like, um, like Tekton, for example, who, you know, is, has really invested in, um, you know, in feature stores and, you um, uh, you know, the, the many companies in the monitoring space, many companies in the space of like um, robust uh, machine learning. So it's uh, it's cool to see those. Um, and um, I would also say probably infrastructure, probably like basically data um, labeling and acquisition companies like Labelbox and mm-hmm. Scale AI have also enabled a lot of the ecosystem. I'm trying to look for ones where like, you know, people are, you know, thinking of things basically very differently because of them. And I think things like open AI and, and label box and scale just make it easier for more teams to say, yeah, you know, I'm going to try doing this, you know, potentially like expensive thing of getting a lot of people to, to look at something and figuring out how to manage that. Do you still feel like there's room for innovation in the MLOps space? I think there is. Yeah. I think especially because the, the ML applications are changing or sorry the, the algorithms are changing so quickly i think there is um i think it's still you know kind of complicated you have to hook together a bunch of different things and if someone figures out a, a better way to do at least like specific applications i think it will help so i think all these spaces like data is, is similar i think they can get simpler over time and um, if people figure out how to do that like that it'll be if you make it simpler you also make it accessible to a much larger um, set of users so um, you actually have a ton of new people that basically expand the market so i think that's gonna Fair. happen yeah that's a what an absolute pleasure man thank you so much for coming on here i think this is a perfect place to end it great thanks so much for having me 